Welcome, everybody. We are going to be talking about technology guide number one tonight, which focuses on hardware. Uh, and it is not my intent to go through every single slide here, by the way, but I'm going to hit highlights and talk about what I think are some of the more important aspects uh, of hardware. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the four things that might appear, you know, well, we have three chapters and the technology guide, which are part of that first quiz that we just talked about. Uh, here are the learning objectives for uh, the technology guide, and, and this is essentially an appendix to the book. So rather than wasting a chapter talking about what hardware is, um, the author kind of considers it a given in this field, and so they put it in an appendix. But I, I tell my students, that, like, if you're new to this, you need to read that, right? If, if you already get hardware and you've worked it already, great, right? You, you might be able to kind of gloss over this. But if you're brand new to IT, or more importantly, I think if you really want to learn it properly, there's there's always stuff, new stuff going on in every aspect of IT. So learn and read everything you possibly can. Some of it might be repeat, but some of it might be brand new or filling in a gap in your knowledge that you didn't even know you had. You know, or answering, you know, the, the terminology part of it even. All right, so this is the, the layout of uh, the chapter and the topics. Um, so I'm just going to jump right over here to the fifth slide and start talking about when we, when we talk about hardware, really what we're talking about is the physical aspect of the technology. We can touch the hardware. So right now I'm sitting in front of this uh, laptop that I bought myself a few months ago. Um, and it has a keyboard, mouse, a screen speakers are built in there's a camera and microphone I got a bunch of doodads plugged in so I can plug in my monitor um, and I call that hardware sure enough it's hard I can touch it <laughs> you know um, and I can see it and you know for as silly as that sounds you know I, I just want to make sure that people get that you know hardware is a physical thing um, you know hardware when we, when we start to break a computer down it really a computer is just a dumb machine you know and uh, one of my very first instructors in, in IT, um, she had she had quite uh, quite a bedside manner about her. Um, she was a little, fairly gruff as an individual, let's just say, but she was really knowledgeable and she was totally right. She's like, you know what, this is just a dumb machine. Without me telling it what to do, it doesn't know what to do. It just sits there. It's a it's it's about as good as a car without a battery or fuel in it. You know, it's not going to go anywhere. And even if you have a battery and fuel, you still need a driver to make it go. And that's what hardware is, folks. So hardware, um, you know, does require software to run. But when we look at hardware, we basically break the portions of the hardware into these different um, areas, you know, so that we have the CPU, the storage that we've talked about already, uh, input and output technologies and communication technologies. What, what is fascinating about uh, hardware, you know, is there's all these different things that are happening with hardware out in the field right now. And normally I would probably skip over this slide because really it is more about um, concepts related to hardware as opposed to the hardware itself. Um, but things change very fast with hardware. So, you know, I just look at smartphones, for example. So a lot of us you know, are, are holding smartphones in our hands or in our pockets or probably like chatting with their friends right now as I'm lecturing <laughs> on their phone, perhaps say hey, whatever, I'm not judging um, uh, a little bit, but not not too much. Um, but, you know, when we look at hardware, we've had rapid advances, you know, as we talked about. So like humankind went through all, like thousands of years of human history to get to the point where we could build computing devices. And then once we had them, all of a sudden, throw in a little bit of electricity, uh, you know, uh, solid state technology, and we keep building on what our predecessors have done. And oh my God, we are ramping up the technology so quickly, it makes you wonder if we didn't like maybe pull some of it from an alien aircraft or something and clone it or something, you know, because how did we think of, you know, how did we advance so quickly? You know, a hundred years ago, uh, nobody had electricity or a phone or, or running water in their house, and now everybody has it, and everybody's got a, an iPhone or, a, or an Android device, um, and we're frustrated with how slow it is. And um, we have these rapid developments that are happening, and the most rapid of the developments really have happened from basically like the early 60s and 70s 
uh, but really exploded during the 80s and 90s. And then when you brought the internet into the mix and things grew so quickly. Um, and one of the, you know, the aspects that, that or things that we think about, right? It's like, as they say here, you know, we get more technology for less money all the time, right? So the computer we buy today, probably in a couple of years, you can buy it for like a hundred bucks <laughs> and you want to throw it out. Uh, not if you shop wisely, by the way. Um, and, and so we're always upgrading to get the latest, greatest and whatever. Um, but we also have this trend happening and, and I want to, you know, point out this like BYOD thing, which stands for bring your own device and how a lot of companies and organizations are allowing for this now. And so, for example, where I work, Gateway gives me a laptop to use, like fantastic. I'm not using it right now. I'm using my own. Why? Because it's better. <laughs> you know, Gateway's got like a business class machine. I've got a gaming laptop that's got like proper video performance and audio performance, you know, and that's just a personal thing. Uh, and I tend to like to use my own equipment because I can configure it, right? Um, but a lot of companies are, are allowing people to use their own devices because they are finding that in some ways it boosts productivity, lowers their costs, allows people to work on platforms they're comfortable with and still accomplish the same tasks. Let's say if you need to answer an email real quick, does it matter if you're doing it on your phone or sitting at your desk computer? Maybe you're not at your desk, but I'm still, maybe I'm standing in the cafeteria and I got a message from my boss and I can respond to it right away. It's okay that I use my own device, right? Okay, so there, there's debates in that, but that's a really big growth movement because when you start to bring those devices into workplaces, what happens? Security issues pop up, right? So that, that's a real big one. But that trend is not going away and a lot of companies are embracing it but they have to completely change how they secure their data in the process and that and their networks all right so let's let's move on to the types of computers and we start with you know uh, what i would call like the mainframe you know level and work down uh you know to the smaller form factors um interestingly you know mainframe computers and supercomputers are a pretty rare breed and, and the truth is even in big data centers we're not really using what we would call a mainframe computer. A mainframe computer is one that has significant computing capability, usually many, many, many computing cores, meaning CPUs, many, many hard drives and storage capabilities, redundant power supplies, uh, extreme amounts of storage, um, and usually are tasked to really large tasks, and so are supercomputers. Uh, interestingly, uh, and a lot of people don't know this, Wisconsin is actually home to one of the first supercomputer manufacturers. Does anybody know what company that was? We don't think of Wisconsin being in that in that field, but there was a company up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin called Cray, C-R-A-Y, which is still around, by the way. I think they've moved, but I'm, I, th I, th I think they still have a presence in Eau Claire, but they were one of the first companies to build uh, supercomputers um, and computers that we use to do things like uh, do complicated weather model forecasting or calculations for uh, space program launches, you know, where they have all these like a thousand variables they're considering or something. Um, and, you know, and, and typically you're not going to see like pictures of supercomputers like on, on Google or somebody like running out and, hey, I just got a supercomputer at the garage sale. That's not happening. But when, when you look at like supercomputers and you start to look at like, you know, what we think, and, and even the things that we see here are not really supercomputers, by the way, these are just racks of servers, which are more like normal servers. Um, so usually, uh, okay, so here we go. That is a, a true supercomputer. This is actually one of the Cray uh, supercomputers, they always built them in this kind of like round format, but it just has extreme computing capability used for super, super high end functions with a super high end price tag. To go with it. All right. Mainframes often, for the most part, will tend to look like big boxes uh, and they're not the size of any ACK or anything like that. They're usually more the size of a refrigerator, uh, typically a mainframe computer system. Uh, from there, we kind of move down uh, the line to what I think of more like typical um, 
servers and, and, and stuff. And we're going to start going through some of these. So let's talk about the computers that we're more used to as consumers. Now, when the computer revolution started happening, we really went right to desktop PCs, right? It was kind of like this revolution. Yes, they were building all these big computers for universities and corporations and government. Uh, but wouldn't it be cool if somebody thought if we could build a personal computer? Um, in some of the very first commercially available uh, personal computers, one of note uh, is the Altair computer. And oh, of course, it, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Little do I know it's like an anime character, but here's, here's the Altair computer. Uh, and it's, I want you to notice a couple things about it. Well, first of all, it does not natively have a screen or a keyboard or a mouse or a printer, right? In fact, it's like a bunch of switches and lights, a la ENIAC, right? Uh, you know, so that's kind of how ENIAC worked too. Eventually, people did hot rod these things and they would hook up monitors and disk drives. Um, but if I remember right, like some of these, uh, old Altair computers that you could buy ran in the neighborhood of like seven, eight, nine thousand dollars back in an era, like in the seventies, where you could buy like a brand new, like 98 Oldsmobile for like 2000 bucks, you know, <laughs> loaded, you know, and so it would take you like the equivalent to buying like four luxury automobiles to buy a computer. So the only people that were really computing on that kind of level were people that really had a lot of money. So like ultra geeks who you know, had money burning a hole in their pocket, right? Um, from there, we kind of went through this whole thing where people started uh, adding, you know, monitors and stuff to their computers. And, and you know, one of the first um, computers that became, you know, commercially available. And so this is actually a picture of the first computer that was built by Apple uh, in a garage out of like, Heath kit and Radio Shack parts, you know, assembled, they wired it together, they figured out how to program it. Um, and they built an empire out of this. And now they're the, the, the most cash rich company on the planet. And it started in a garage with a couple guys without a college degree. And I'm not telling you not to get a college degree, you should still get your college degree. But you see back then, they didn't know what to make the case out of they just made it out of wood. <laughs> you know, um, hey, it worked. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it started a revolution. It really did. Of course, we had lots of other computers that came along later on. Uh, we had like the IBM, like 8088s, um, you know, computers that had like the green screens and stuff. And then we kind of ended up in the era that we're in now. But the personal computing market uh, really kind of started with desktop PCs. Um, and then kind of extended to other areas. What most of us use now, or what most of us consider a full-blown computer system these days, tends to be a laptop, right? And so most of us, if we're gonna, hey, I'm gonna buy myself a new computer, you go to the laptop section. You're, most of us are not buying desktops. Uh, and then, you know, if we are buying desktops, does anybody here have a, using a desktop right now? I'm just curious. And Josh, why are you using it why are you using a desktop and i think i know the answer already i mean because it's it's my big screen and i can sit in my chair and i built it and i want to use it i mean right and you uh, get a whole lot more for your money too right? i mean yeah that's true yeah absolutely right and and that's really kind of a a big piece especially if you build it yourself um but just so you guys know this you will always get more performance out of a desktop computer than an equivalently priced laptop. Why? Because they don't have to make the components custom for the machine. They don't have, you know, you can put in whatever components you want usually. And there's usually better cooling, better power, better subsystems, and they just work better. I mean, that's the bottom line. Um, that's why I had a really hard choice, Josh, when, when, when I bought my machine. It's like, yeah, I need another laptop for myself. It's been, you know, seven, eight years, but I really, uh, shopped around a lot because I, I wanted a laptop that that had graphic performance because that was a really big issue for me because I do a lot of like multimedia work. Um, but most of us, you know, tend to be in that position where we mostly have um, 
laptop computers, some people call them notebooks, whatever. But what the heck is a netbook? And you know, when they put this slide together, when this book was first published, we call them netbooks. What falls into the category of a netbook? How about a Chromebook? Book, Chromebook. Yeah. That's the one that's really exploded lately. And when the pandemic hit, most schools issued Chromebooks for their students, right? And if you know anything about Chromebooks, Chromebooks are like laptops. Exactly. And in many cases, you know, they look like they're great, right? But they don't have the computing power and you can't load software on them really. And you can't stir files on them really, you know? They connect to the internet to do all their work. And so the concept was actually one that was developed, you know, a couple decades earlier. You know, they, somebody had a vision to say, yeah, we're gonna have these things called netbooks, these like super low powered computers. We don't need to be powerful because they're just gonna connect to the internet. They're gonna be basically like a dumb client that's just going to pull them stuff to the screen and we can do whatever it's all online so who cares how powerful it is and here we are in that era where consumers are uh, you know willingly buying these machines you know when my when my mother-in-law who was always in the habit of calling me for tech support by the way she said i need to buy a new laptop ty uh what do you suggest i'm like you know chromebooks are really cheap and they're really cool <laughs> and you know what Ever since she's owned that, I don't think I've helped. I think I helped her set up the Wi-Fi password on it. I haven't talked to her since. When she was running a PC, oh my God, it was like every other week. I think I got another virus, you know? And I'm not trying to make fun of her, but that's one of the reasons why schools use them, right? If you can't install software on them and you can't do some of the stuff you do on a normal computer, in some ways it also makes it a lot safer. And folks, let's be realistic. Most of the stuff that we do on a computer tends to be through the web browser for most normal people right and so something that really is designed to just deliver internet to you in some cases is absolutely the right answer right uh, we also have tablets and, and mobile devices but you know from the standpoint of um you know what the form factors look like you know and, and, and granted these are kind of <laughs> somewhat antiquated photographs um, we kind of went through this whole like tablet era too, and I think the tablet era has, has kind of faded a little bit. Um, although the new Apple iPads are, some of them are so powerful, they're basically computers at this point. Um, really have been for a while. Um, you know, when you when you start to think about like if you are buying something, you really start to think need to think about how you use a computer, and so some of you might have done that when you started school right so you might be like you know what i'm going to school i need to get myself a computer and some people will just rush out and buy it thinking they're getting the right thing in some cases it's smarter to wait and see what you really need but whenever you're going into an it program whatever a regular student might need a gateway to do their work we need more in fact we need a lot more and, and in fact, you know, that's why I give you those hardware recommendations. You want as much RAM as you can afford, as much hard drive as you can afford, and as much processing power as you can afford. And I argue as much screen real estate as you can afford as well. You know, don't buy like a little 13 inch notebook and think you're going to be okay in a few years after staring at that screen. I learned the hard way, which is one of the things, you know, one of my issues of why I chose a better graphics machine. Um, full HD, super high refresh rate. And then I bought an external monitor that's even better than the one that's on my machine. So next to me here, I have a 27 inch with 144 re rehertz or um, 144 hertz refresh rate possible, you know, and it's not running at that speed right now. So I know that if I'm gaming or if I'm doing video work or processing photographs or running a whole bunch of programs at the same time, my gear can handle it. Right. Uh, but those are considerations that I knew for myself. And how do I know that I'm reaching limits with my equipment? Because I'd be, I would be doing stuff like editing a video and it would choke on my old machine. And now I'm doing it on my new machine and it's like smooth as silk. Right. And it wasn't that my old machine was a slouch. It was an I seven with 16 gigs of Ram, but it didn't come anywhere close to what I'm doing on this machine. And so you, it, it you need to think about how you're using the machine. IT people need more capability than a normal consumer. So you're not the person that's going to buy that $300 laptop at Walmart. You're more in the four-figure range. 
as a starting point, you know? So when you guys go out to shop, that's what you should shop for. Um, but whatever you do, and if you're helping anybody else pick equipment, that's a major consideration. What do you plan on doing with that machine? You know, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, well, get the Chromebook. <laughs> you know, if that's all you're doing, why bother spending a thousand bucks? But if you're doing any creative work, you're developing content, you're programming, you're doing multimedia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, multitasking in the process, you want more. All right, so please uh, think about that. And then also think about how long you keep a machine in service. So one thing that, that often happens is people will buy an inexpensive machine um, and inexpensive machines are built inexpensively, by the way, and they tend to fall apart a lot quicker than, you know, so you can buy an HP for 300 bucks or you can buy one for 1500 bucks. And which one do you think is gonna last you longer, right? It, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, and then you look at Apple, you know, that's, that's the other issue that people run into. It's like, man, why would I buy an Apple laptop? It costs two times as much for the same stuff. And I'm like, well, you're not really comparing apples to apples, but I'm bum, bum, right? Um, <laughs> you may be comparing apples to HPs, I don't know. Um, but I've discovered with Apple products that whenever I've owned one, um, I get such a long life out of it compared to a PC. Like for example, the Mac mini I have uh, sitting up on my shelf here, uh, I've been running this one for 11 years now, and it still works great. Try that with a PC. In my last Mac desktop that I had, because this is basically a desktop machine, I bought in 2000, or excuse me, 1998 or 99, I bought a G4 with a 23-inch display. It really cost me a fortune back then. But I productively used that machine up until 2012 and then sold it. I sold the CPU for 200 bucks, you know, the box, and then I was able to sell the display for 250, 13 years, 14 years later. Try that with a PC, that ain't happening, right? Um, and then you can't compare specs, folks, because apples are built differently. They have different technology, the subsystems, uh, you know, you look at CPU to CPU, sure that PC is gonna rock the CPU specs, but the subsystem it's connected to on the Apple is built to work with it where the PC might not. And so the data throughput is faster on the Mac. That's why multimedia work is always more stable on a Macintosh than it is on a PC. And you know, there's, you pay more, but you get more longevity out of it. I would argue, at least in the past, I would argue better build quality. I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, and I'm not, not trying to push you to be uh, a Mac person. Uh, in terms of like, any computer that we use, all the computers that we use will have input devices and output devices attached to them. And in some cases, those devices are the same thing. Um, and they talk about some kind of like weird ones here, like human data entry devices, gesture based input. What the heck is that? Yeah, like your phone, right? Exactly. Like if you swipe on your phone and this new laptop that I bought here is not touchscreen, right? My, my last one that I bought, ironically, like eight years ago was, and I found myself using it so little, I was like, why do I need a touchscreen? <laughs> you know, uh, I think only my wife would use it, like if we were watching something and she want, like I was like, like scrolling and she'd be like, no, click, <laughs> you know, uh, not, not to make fun of it. But yeah, gesture based inputs is all about our hands. You know, it's all about swiping, poking, tapping, all those things. And a lot of that now works also on our touchpads. Um, you know, when we think about human data entry devices, really, and, and input devices in general, these are the classics, right? So key, uh, keyboard and mouse, and a lot of these really are just different forms of mice, right? And, you know, it's interesting to look at the PowerPoint because you wonder how long ago it was developed because there's optical mouse and a trackball and a pointing stick um, and a touchpad. And there was a time when the touchpad was not the preeminent mouse on a laptop, by the way. They didn't really start coming in you know, until about 10, 15 years ago, but now that's like pretty much the rule. My favorite of all of these, when I was like uh, coming up in the laptop world was the pointing stick, which was like a little eraser in the middle of the keyboard. Um, and actually my school issued laptop, which is a Lenovo has both a trackpad 
or a touchpad and a pointing stick. And I used to be so good with the pointing stick. And what I liked about it is because it was in the middle of the keyboard, I could do the home row typing thing and you just have to move your finger over just a little bit to move to the stick. It was super efficient. And then you would click with your thumbs, right? So anybody that's ever had like a IBM ThinkPad knows what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, so th those are kind of a thing. Uh, we also have graphics tablets, and I never owned one of those up until a few years ago when my daughter started getting into graphics and I bought her a little Wacom tablet. And so that's where you have like an electronic pen and like in a, a surface that like if you're an artist and you're used to drawing with physical media, uh, it allows you to draw on a computer screen like you would normally. And she really digs that uh, quite a bit. And if you've never tried one and you're an artist, you owe it to yourself to at least try one. Um, other things, joystick, sure, touch screen, we talked about that. Yeah, the stylus, right? Um, any of you have phones that have a stylus? No, right? I used to have one old Windows phone that had one. Uh, but of course, that was a horrible phone. <laughs> but there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, computer systems that you can actually buy that have touch screens that are designed for doing artwork that have electronic styluses. Um, and people do use those things. Uh, webcams, voice recognition, absolutely. Have you guys ever used like the Google voice search features? No, yeah. yes. Have you? Yeah, it's pretty scary actually um, at times. Uh, moving on to the gesture based things, uh, you know, so we think about, um, you know, touch screens on devices. But really what they were referring to, so as you can see on this slide, is gesture recognition. So if you guys have ever used the Wii, or if you have, um, you know, an Xbox and it's got like the 3D scanner on top where it reads your, your arm movements to be part of the game, that's what we're talking about. The one at the bottom of that list is a really weird one. Has anybody ever heard of that device? My previous laptop actually had one. Uh, I didn't buy it because of that. It just happened to be one of the features that was inclu included. And what it was, was this little infrared projector uh, just below the keyboard that would project up an infrared beam. And I could just put my hand in the air and go, or like that. And it would read my gestures in the air to operate the computer. It was horrible. <laughs> By the way, I try to use it. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. I'm going to freak out my friends and uh, it sucks. You know, it was just terrible. Um, and then when they, uh, you know, when we upgraded to Windows 8, you know, because I bought the machine with Windows 7 on it, um, they didn't make drivers for it anymore. So I have this like thing that's on my laptop that I can't even use. The only thing that it was cool for is they had this one game where you could, you could uh, basically take this like glowing orb and throw it at things to knock them down. That, that was kind of okay. But everything else, like regular computer use, it was useless. Absolutely useless. Lots of different types of input devices we don't think about, though, um, extend to a lot of different areas. So like when we walk into a store and we buy something and we swipe our credit card or we put our chip card into a machine, or if you're like me and you pay with tap, right? Um, yeah, we're sending input to other devices. So like, that's my favorite way to pay now, by the way, is I set up Google Pay on my phone and then I unlock it and then I just hold it up to the, you know, the, the thing, either the, the gas pump or the, the little card reader, you know, and most stores will have it. Um, and it pulls off my same accounts. You know, and I think we talked about that too, but I think that's a really cool uh, device. Other types of input devices that are kind of interesting are, uh, all the different uh, cameras and scanners and uh, things that are embedded into checks. Uh, this one I think is particularly interesting, RFID, which is basically passive electronic chips. And I don't know if you guys are aware of these, but when you, let's say you walk into a clothing store and you're looking at like the Calvin Klein sweater or something, right? And you try it on and you forget to pay for it and walk out the door and all of a sudden the, the sensor's beeping. What's making it beep? Well, they put a little tag either directly in the clothing or they attach a thing to it, you know, that you can't take off yourself, um, that triggers the alarm system at the store by just walking through a sensor. And there's no electronics involved. It's not like there's batteries in the sweater, but they got this chip that's passive 
that once you walk through a magnetic field becomes activated by the magnetic field and then they can read the data off of it. This is a really fascinating technology. It's been around forever, right? Um, actually, it's been around for about 30, 40 years um, and people use it in very many different ways. The, the store security thing is probably the most common. And in fact, um, if you have like a book that you maybe you paid a lot of money for, even the textbook for this class, maybe you bought it from the bookstore. If you look in there, they might have a little sticker in there that's actually an RFID chip meant to trigger the sensor. And then when you go to the counter, they, they deactivate it so you can walk through without triggering it. What I find very fascinating is some companies use these devices in kind of interesting ways. So first of all, if you think about the fact that some clothing that you buy has this sewn into the fabric, all right, not a sensor that was attached by a store clerk, but some clothing manufacturers are sewing these into the fabric. What does that mean for us? What it means is you can be tracked passively electronically tracked and what a lot of people don't realize is that even our cell phones i can take my battery out i can disable the gps i can pull out my sim card but my phone still has an rfid chip in it that can be tracked if enough electromagnetic uh, energy is sent into it that's fascinating to me and so don't ever think as long as you're holding one of these I don't care if it's charged or not, or you pull your SIM card out or whatever, you're still being tracked, folks. <laughs> um, but the technology has a lot of really positive uses. One real positive use of it, you look at a company like uh, Walmart, for example. When they ship product from their warehouses to their stores, they put the stuff on a pallet, they shrink wrap the pallet, and then they put on the pallet a tag saying, okay, pallet number 52, with an RFID chip. The moment that pallet arrives at a store and crosses the threshold into the building, the system inventory system at that store reads the chip and reads the product right into their inventory system without a human being even touching a thing. It's all automatic. There are companies, um, Target, Home Depot, I'm trying to think of a few of the others. Those are two of the big ones. Um, are trying to institute a program where every product has an RFID chip in it. You walk into the store, put the stuff in your cart, and walk out. How did you pay? Well, all the, all the products have an RFID chip on them. Your payment on your phone, maybe the one thing you'd have to do is maybe unlock your phone as you're walking through the threshold. They just grab the payment right off your phone as you walk out, and you're done. Sounds like science fiction. They've been working on this for 20 years. And they've piloted it in some places. Now, some some companies, uh, interestingly, uh, I forget if it's Sam's Club or Costco. I want to say it's Sam's Club. Um, they have kind of an app that I've been kind of using. Every time I go there, I hate waiting in line. Like you go there on a Saturday, and there's like 20 people in line with giant cartfuls of stuff. And I'm just like buying like laundry detergent or something. And so they have this like scan and go app. <laughs> Not quite this, but I just walk up, I, I, you know, I walk in, show my phone. Here's my membership card. It's on my phone. I go in, I grab the product, I scan the product with the app. And then when I'm ready to walk out, I just hit pay and walk out, show the people at the door my phone. They scan my phone and I'm good. I don't have to go to the checkout. How cool is that? That's the future of shopping, right? And uh, RFID is one of the technologies that makes it possible, by the way. We also have lots of output devices, folks. So, um, you know, traditional output devices are, are most typically these things. So like, you know, uh, what we see on the screen, we print to a printer or we hear sound coming out of the machine. Monitors in particular are kind of interesting because we've kind of gone through this evolution. We are now at the point where, you know, if you're out, out buying a display, most likely you buy an LED display that's HD, I would hope. Um, but there's all sorts of other types of displays, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of ignoring the old CRTs and LCDs at this point, but we are starting to see flexible displays. So we are starting to see some of that science fiction stuff come in, right? So we have foldable phones. Um, we also have things that scan our hmm, retinal scanning displays. Have you guys ever unlocked your phone with your retina? Have you guys ever done that? 
Yeah. See, I on my phone, if I if I lock it and then I unlock it, it goes into this mode. Right now, it's waiting for my eyes. So if I just look at the phone, it's unlocked. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I think it's horrible in some ways because wait, somebody's got my retina scan. But at the same time, boy, if my hands are covered with like um, I don't know cake frosting or something, not that not a, not a usual occurrence, but maybe. Um, and I want to unlock my phone with one hand and I can't type in the code, right? I can just look at my phone and unlock it. How cool is that? And how that um, you know ends up being a uh, output device, I'm not entirely sure because really it's happening with the combination of the camera and the screen. Um, now, I don't know how many of you even have a printer at home anymore. Is there anybody that, that doesn't even have a printer? Okay. Do, do you ever find yourself needing to print, Josh? Uh, yeah, I just go to the library and pay the 10 cents a, a page and kind of deal with it. Right. Like if you really, really need to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the attitude has changed a lot on it. I used to, um, mostly by virtue of running my own businesses, I used to actually have a whole collection of printers. We would have all our black and white lasers, and then we had a couple of color lasers, and then we had ink jets for photos. And uh, depending on what we were doing, and when you run a business, by the way, whenever you have like a production machine, you always have to have a backup for it, right? So you can't just have the one laser printer you're relying on. If that goes down, what are you doing, <laughs> right? So then you have to have a backup. And so at one point, I, I think I had probably like 10 or 15 printers at the, at the business. And this was, you know, a place with like 10 people working there and there's like printer per person. Uh, but I've discovered here at home now, I, I have a laser and I have an inkjet. We like never, ever, 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 ever use them. And then when my wife will say, hey, uh, can you print this for me? I print it out for her and, and she never looks at it. <laughs> you know, so um, I, I can almost say that, you know, aside from work, I really never need to print anything. And that's really kind of the era we're in. There's Interesting a huge which, one missing though. There's no 3D printers on that slide. Right, right. And you know, they kind of put that in a different category. <laughs> oh, never mind. I'll be quiet. So, yeah, and yeah, they, they kind of, and you're right, it should be there. Um, and here's something really interesting, you guys. Um, Gateway has a facility called the IMET facility, which is out in Sturdivant, right underneath the water tower, if you guys are familiar with that location, right by the movie theater, so Highway H and 20, roughly. Um, and in that building, we have this facility called the Fab Lab. And that facility has um, various 3D printers. They probably have like maybe like 10 or 20 small 3D printers that print with plastics, but then they have larger ones that print with like ceramics and metals and stuff. And they have one that's like uh, like a meter by a meter and, you know, cube in size, if you can imagine that. Um, and it's a facility that's open to the public. You don't even have to be a Gateway student to come in and use it. And if you guys have never visited, I would encourage you someday, if you're driving by that campus to come in, and if it's open, go into the lab. And they have people running the lab that will go, hey, you want to learn about 3D printing? Come on in. Let's print something, you know. And they'll, uh, and what I've discovered is they can do all sorts of stuff. And I'm going to start taking advantage of it when I go back to campus. Because you can do all sorts of really cool stuff in that room, by the way. But it's free to use. It's a community resource, uh, not exclusive to Gateway uh, uh, students. All right. I, I do want to kind of jump ahead here to the CPU part. And talk about how uh, CPUs work uh, partially and kind of give you an idea that a CPU is um, not the big box that's sitting on your desk, right? So like a lot of, a lot of us, we look at that box that the computer's in, we call it the CPU. Wrong answer. CPU is just one little chip, one little chip on the motherboard of that system. And that does all, basically all the work on a computer. Um, you know, they go through the process here, and, and I hope you guys read this, uh, you know, about how the CPU works, where we basically have information that flows into the CPU, it's processed somehow, and then it's moved along to do whatever task it needs to do. Um, they go through this, uh, this whole process of explaining the system, but here's a graph, and, it, and I think the graphic kind of really makes it resonate a little bit better. There's one thing that happens in IT, and this slide begins to epitomize it, 
in when we study IT, a lot of it is based upon branches of mathematical theory and branches of logic. And people who developed those two areas did a lot of significant um, you know, advancements within the last few hundred years. So up until like the 1600s, the Western world had kind of lost a lot of the mathematical knowledge that we had built up from the ancient world. You know, so, you know, um, Rome got invaded, basically, Athens got invaded, uh, Egypt got invaded, and all the libraries were burned out, bombed, destroyed, and a lot of the knowledge was lost with it. Unfortunately, um, some of the, the Middle Eastern and Eastern countries retained copies of some of the Western knowledge, which is how we got some of it back, and it was really partially responsible for part of the Renaissance. But when we hit the age of Renaissance, like 16, 1700s, um, we started to develop new branches of mathematics. We started to develop calculus and set theory and probability and statistics and uh, discrete mathematics and these real high level things that if you go on to get a four year or master's degree in computer science, you will learn these things you know, because they're pretty important. But part of those theories also looked at what we call systems um, design and systems um, operate within an environment but systems typically have an input processing and output and one of the things that we learn about when we learn about information systems is the fact that we compare them often to like a manufacturing process where in manufacturing we might have raw materials we feed into the system we process those raw materials and then output them as a tangible product oftentimes with it uh, what we're processing is sometimes we're processing either raw inputs or raw data and we process it and the output for processing raw data is information. How radical is that, right? So we take raw information, process it, and it becomes useful information. And that's, you know, when we think about the computer system, they follow that approach. So when they started building computers, when they started thinking about the analytic engine, and computer programming this is they built it on top of these mathematical theories of system design where we have inputs to a situation we process those inputs and we result with something and you can see that 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 theme follows right down to the circuit level design of the computer so it's not accidental that you will see commonalities between mathematics uh, logic uh, computer hardware design, computer software design, and all those things are interrelated by this very simple model, input, processing, and output. What's fascinating about the CPU is we will send information into it, and we think of it as a kind of like one big group of transistors, but the truth is, is the CPU itself is even broken down into separate, separate pieces. So they have the control unit, which kind of like masterminds the whole thing. The part that does the math that used to be add ons in old systems registers and primary storage or registers are kind of internal CPU storage to feed. To the main memory and notice how they kind of bundle the main memory in with the CPU is kind of what the thing because the CPU cannot operate without RAM you have to have RAM available for it to. <coughs> operate of course primary storage or RAM is volatile memory. So you turn off the power and what happens? It goes away. And that's why we, de we developed secondary storage like hard drives or whatever, or paper, you know, that's secondary storage too, so that we can store the stuff long-term when the power goes off. Um, another tertiary area of the CPU is the, the communication aspect of it. And so uh, the CPU needs to be able to connect to other systems and other subsystems. And this is really kind of a nice little graphic showing all the main aspects of a CPU and a computer system. And then the tie in to where it expands from like circuit level design up to system level design. And so when I teach my students how to do a program, one of the things we do is like, what are your inputs? What do you expect your outputs to be? What process do you need to follow to get there? Same thing happens with the CPU. So we might have inputs where maybe my input is moving a mouse or clicking or typing something, 
we expect the CPU or the software or whatever is loaded up to do something with it and then give me a result. So if I clicked on something, I expect to see the output of like, uh, you know, I, I WASD and, and hit my space bar here or whatever. So I should be jumping and shooting somebody and killing them in my video game. And I expect that output on my screen. We take for granted what happens in the middle, but what happens in the middle is controlled by software. And we as human beings can either buy software to use, or we can create the software to tell the machine what to do with it on a very granular level. And when we first started learning how to do this, it was on almost a circuit level that we were programming, real, real primitive. Um, and now we have the capability where we can do things like talk to the Google search engine and say, Google, um, you, know, you know, who's got a great drink special tonight? That's where I'm going, right? And, and I'm just, I'm, I'm teasing, but we, what's happening there? They're getting our input, they're processing it, they're retrieving results from a database and putting, it, putting some output on the screen. And that's exactly how all technology works. It works off of the system and it's not accidental. It is by design from the circuit level on up, all the way through the conceptual portions of programming and systems integration on enterprise-wide levels. So when people are looking at employing systems in, within an enterprise, they are thinking about what are our inputs? What are we doing with all that stuff? And what do people expect to see as a result? Right. And that that's a really important piece. And that, that's really kind of the killer slide of the whole thing. Uh, and if you uh, have a chance, I would like you guys to make sure that you read through that, um, the rest of the chapter, and look at some of the other uh, bits here. We'll probably talk a little bit more about hardware going in uh, in our next uh, session as well, just to kind of finish off some of this so you guys have those concepts firmly in place. Um, and uh, we are done for the night, so we have reached 730 already. I have a tendency to get a little long winded about this stuff, but hey, I get pretty excited about it, so I, I, I dig it. So hopefully you guys do too. Um, please make sure that you read through all three of those chapters and the technology guide um, or have them handy as you take the quiz, you know, uh, either approach, whatever. Um, my, my preference would be that you actually read it and understand it, but I, I get, you know, sometimes there's practicalities to it. Uh, but also make sure that you keep up with the homework and I have been grading stuff I don't know if you guys have noticed I did a sweep uh, and started grading some things uh, and I'm happy to say that most of you are doing really well. Uh, if you do happen to see a zero listed for any assignments let's say you you missed the due date and you didn't turn it in. I don't want you guys to freak out to the zeros it's it's temporary so as soon as you turn something in your score will replace the zero. But if you're seeing a zero, you probably missed the due date and you're probably going to get a reduction in points. Uh, if you are falling behind and need help getting on track, please reach out to me. I'm happy to help out. And obviously, Kevin and Aaron are also happy to help out. Um, and don't hesitate to go uh, visit with them. You know, I, I, I get it. Sometimes you guys can't meet with me for whatever reason or maybe don't even prefer. And, and I don't take any offense to that. Um, Sometimes it's better to work with a peer. The one thing you should know about tutors though, is they will not necessarily do your work. They will help guide you to do your work. They'll be like, well, what is it asking you to do? Well, how do you do that? <laughs> you know, they'll help you. They won't actually do your homework for you, but they can get you on the right track. And that's a huge thing. It really is. All right, folks, any questions before we adjourn? All right, well, thank you uh, all for being here. Uh, and then I'm going to make sure that uh, Jennifer gets to see this video. And since I went to the trouble of recording it, I'll probably end up posting it uh, tomorrow morning on YouTube, by the way, and put a link right inside unit three. You know, So not quite like the other guys like uh, PowerPoint lectures, but mine are better. Anyhow, so. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. I will see you all next week. Uh, and uh, if you need anything, just reach out by email uh, and I'm glad to help you out. Take care.